Since we have 20 minutes, I have no, not even a second to waste. So let's see the first video. It's only about 23 seconds. What's it doing? <laughs> Whoa. Whoa. Get it. Get it. Okay, so that's how we all start. Right? There's existence, there's experience, there are no constructs, there are no stories, there's delight, there's wonder. There's joy, and there is even a sense of mystery and awe. If you saw that video in 23 seconds, <clears throat> you can see everything. So now deep historians tell us that up until 30,000 years ago, there were seven different types of humans, seven species of humans. We call ourselves homo sapiens. Uh, which means the wise ones. We give ourselves that name. <laughs> but there were other species, Homo habilis, Homo erectus, Florences, Neanderthals, etc. And they all had a very rudimentary language for danger and mating, basically for survival. And then one species, you know, species mates only with its own kind. Um, so we are part of the human family, just like lions, tigers, cheetahs, leopards, part, and your cat are the same family, but they're different species. Wolves, foxes, dogs, etc., are different species. So one species, us, we created a language that went beyond mating calls and beyond danger calls. This baby right now had no constructs, right? Just experience and awareness, that's all. So one species created a language first, and I'm not making this up, this is part of deep history and most uh, anthropologists agree about this. And first, it was a language for gossip. So, you know, even today, the most basic conversation is gossip, right? Professors don't talk about uh, the latest theories in schools. They talk about who's going to get tenure and why, who's sleeping with whom, and who can be trusted, who can't be trusted. And that language for gossip quickly evolved into stories and constructs. And with that, we created the human experience, storytelling. We created money, abstract idea. We created commerce. And the leaders who told the best stories, or the stories that resonated with their followers were able to create huge amounts of influence. So un up until then, the human packs with their leaders could not get more than 100 followers. But when they started telling stories, they got thousands of followers, and then hundreds of thousands of followers, and then millions of followers. If you read Hirari's book, Sapiens, I don't know how many have read that book, he says you can't tell a monkey to give you its banana in the hope that he'll get a million bananas in monkey heaven, but you can do that with human beings. <laughs> Right? <clears throat> so we created empires, monarchs, colonialism, kingdoms, Wall Street, governments, nation states, and uh, uh, political parties. But then we created religion. We created God. We created atheism. We created philosophical systems of thought. We created uh, religious systems of thought. We created uh, scientific systems of thought. 
And then we bought into our stories. And we embedded ourselves into our stories. And the stories started to shape our perception of what we experience out there. I don't know if you, uh, if you know this experiment that was done. It won the uh, neuroscientist the Nobel Prize where um, they took a group of kittens and they brought them up in a room that had only horizontal stripes. And when these kittens grew up to be cats, they could see only a horizontal world. Took another group of kittens, brought them up in a room that had vertical stripes, and when they grew up, they saw a vertical world. What's the world like? Uh, is it vertical or is it, uh, is it horizontal? Well, the initial experience of these kittens and their interpretation in whatever their consciousness is, certainly not in English with an Indian accent, but <laughs> when they saw everything like this, somewhere in their animal awareness, they created the interpretation that everything looks like this. So they couldn't see furniture legs. Because when their neurons were examined, their neural connections were examined, they didn't have the connections to see either horizontal or vertical stimuli. So what I'm suggesting to you is that our perception of what we call reality is actually filtered through our interpretation of experience. That what we call everyday reality is filtered through our interpretation of experience. And right now, the most popular story is the story that we call science. And people trust that story. A few um, years ago, <coughs> I was, I was uh, uh, in Sweden at the conference where they give the Nobel Prize, and um, I was talking about constructs and stories, and somebody in the front, uh, some scientist, said, how did you get here? I said, I took a plane. He said, so you trust science with your life. And case rested. <laughs> and I trust science with the experience that I'm calling body-mind. But I don't think science can tell me what reality is. So in the next 12 minutes, I'm going to try and tell you what reality is. <laughs> OK. <clears throat> So here's, I, I framed these uh, three days ago. Only one person, Saran, here knows about them. Uh, and I'll try and do it as quickly as possible. Uh, is this doesn't seem to be working. Can you do it for me? Please don't waste the construct of time. Uh, OK, so what we call matter or mass is an experience that we have in our consciousness. We call it mass. We call it matter. But actually, it's a sensory experience. Okay, Nobody, as Rupert Spira, if he's here, will tell you, has ever proved the existence of matter. It's an experience. It's a sense perception. It's this. It's this. It's this. It's an experience in consciousness or awareness. But we call it matter. We objectify that experience. And then we go down the rabbit hole. We say it's made of subatomic particles, which no one has seen, even at the Hadron Collider. Um, they see trails of these particles. Go back. They see trails of these particles. So subatomic matter is an indirect experience and a concept. As particles, it's an experience. As, as waves, it's a concept. Experiences and concepts are activities in consciousness. Again, if Rupert is here, I borrowed his, his definition. Consciousness is that in which uh, experience occurs. It's that in which experience is known. And it's, it's that out of which uh, experience is made. So consciousness is modifying itself 
as experience, then we objectify that and we call it body, mind, and universe. And then we go down further in the rabbit hole and say energy, which physicists define as the ability to do work, uh, is the same as matter. Matter and energy are inseparable. Like, and I'm raising my hands, I'm speaking to you. Um, that's energy, and they're inseparable, and every schoolboy or schoolgirl knows the equation E is equal to mc squared. But then again, further down the rabbit hole, neither matter nor energy can be created or destroyed. But since matter and energy are concepts of experiences in consciousness, it's obvious then that uh, uh, consciousness can also be neither created nor destroyed. Consciousness is eternally in the eternal now, modifying itself as experience in the form of experience that we call matter, energy, and concepts based on that. So all experience can be summarized as the acronym SIFT, S-I-F-T. Sensations, which include sense perceptions, images, feelings, thoughts. And then thought, of course, is the interpretation of that experience. And they're, they're entangled. If you change a thought, you change a perception. If you change the perception, you change the interpretation of the thought. If you like it, you call it an emo emotion. If you dislike it, you also call it an emotion. And then, of course, that generates imagination, um, which are images in our all uh, consciousness. But there's no experience that is outside of SIFT. Consciousness is sifting itself as experience that we call mind, body, universe. So that little baby, okay, is playing with a toy. It has no religious constructs, no theological constructs, no philosophical constructs, no scientific constructs, because they're all stories. There's interpretations of sense perceptions, which we call thoughts. And then we elaborate those theories and we go deeper down the rabbit hole. Mathematical constructs, uh, which uh, constructs of space-time and causality. And as we do that, uh, we forget that the ground state of all these modified states is just pure consciousness. And that's who we are. We are that consciousness which is all possibilities before the story. We are a species of consciousness, an incarnation as, um, as the Indian texts often say of Vishnu, and the evolution of what we call species is actually the evolution of species of consciousness. And when we stop identifying with these transient modified states, we know ourselves as that pure consciousness. And that is the freedom from all constructs, including the construct that there's something called a mind, including the construct that there's something called a body, and including the story that there's something called the universe. That's a human story. If you say, I'm a body, which one are you talking about? You don't have the same body you had today that you had two years ago, or when you were a baby, or when you were a teenager. If you say you are a mind, which thoughts are you identifying with? If you say we live in space-time, then what happened yes to yesterday? Where is yesterday now? Where is five minutes now? Where is a second ago now? You see, all experience is ungraspable. Whether it's a thought or an emotion or a sensation or a perception, you can't grasp it. You can't grasp the past, you can't grasp the future, but you cannot grasp now 
because it's over before I finish the sentence, the first part of my sentence is over. That's why Wittgenstein said, we are asleep. Our life is a dream. But once in a while, we wake up enough to know that we are dreaming. So what I'd like you to do right now as you're listening to me, just be aware of that which is listening. That awareness is the only reality because it is not in time. Time is also a construct. So um, please wake up <laughs> because the dream has turned into a nightmare, <laughs> right? Our collective dream is, what is our collective dream right now? It's uh, violence, it's um, terrorism, it's eco-destruction, it's climate change, it's the extinction of species, it's mechanized death, and now the scenario that if we don't wake up, consciousness itself will say, the human species was an interesting experiment but it didn't work. <laughs> I have four minutes, and I thought what I'd do with that four minutes is share with you a song that George Harrison wrote um, when I met him in 1988. I spent a month with him in England. We had the same conversation. And then he dropped me to the airport, and he, on a piece of napkin uh, paper, he had the lyrics of the song and he gave me a CD and the song was never published till after his death. So as a tribute to my friend George Harrison, um, the universe doesn't exist, it's in you. You are the universe. The body is in you, the mind is in you, the universe is in you. So please um, play the song.
there you are. Um, uh, reality cannot be a system of thought, be it religion, be it science, be it philosophy. It has to go right to the heart, to the source of thought. And therefore, no science, no philosophy, no theology, no religion can give us access to reality. Have to get rid of every construct, every story. You know, having said that, I'm going to end with a quote from Lord Krishna, <laughs> <laughs> who says, Prakritim swamvasht bhai vishrajami puna puna. Curving back within myself, I create again and again. I create the mind, I create the body, and I create the universe. You are the universe. Thank you.